for logging in to the virtual Map the System National Finals event. Welcome to the Map the System Canada online final event. My name is Latasha Kafrobe and I am the current program manager for Map the System Canada. I will be one of your co-hosts today. We're excited to share this event with you, um, celebrating the remarkable work of Canadian students this year. Welcome to all of you students, educators, judges, and fans. While we are unable to gather in person, the Map the System Canada final event gathers us all here today to celebrate the hard work and research that our Canadian students have done this year. We have guests tuning in from across the country, so I encourage you um, to drop in the chat box where you are tuning in from. A few things to go over before we get started. Because we are using Zoom webinar today, there is no need for attendees to have their camera on. We also encourage you to use the chat box. A member of our organizing team will be monitoring the chat box throughout today's events. We especially support you sharing words of encouragement to competing teams in the chat box today throughout the, present, throughout the team presentations. Today's event will be recorded and will be available on our Map the System Canada YouTube channel early next week. So please cozy up, grab a drink and some snacks and get ready for a remarkable amount of presentations today. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I would like to acknowledge the land and traditional territories in which we e-meet today. At the Institute for Community Prosperity, reconciliation is an active movement for us. And while we are unable to gather in person, we take every opportunity to acknowledge the land and peoples that make it possible for all of us to gather and prosper today. The Institute for Community Prosperity is situated within the traditional territories of the Siksigate Tikibi and within the Treaty 7 region. We recognize that viewers are tuning in from across the country. Um, prior to European settlement, this land that we all reside in um, was fully inhabited by Indigenous people. There are over three, 634 First Nations who live in what is now known as Canada. This land, um, on this land, there is also over 70 distinct indig Indigenous languages that are spoken. Indigenous people continue to be the original caretakers of this land, and it is to them we owe thanks for this opportunity to live in such a great nation. As part of reconciliation, we acknowledge our duty to strive for the truth and to work with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people of Canada in a consensual, reciprocal, and respectful way to build a prosperous future for everyone. If you don't know the traditional or treaty lands that you reside on, we encourage you to do some research um, and we will be dropping a really helpful link in the chat box in just a moment. So let's get started. Today I am joined by my colleagues James Stotch and Amy Rintoul from the Institute for Community Prosperity. We will be your virtual hosts. Behind the scenes, we also have Colson who will be monitoring the chat box and offering tech support to all presenters. The Institute has been organizing the Canadian edition of Map the System since 2018, and we are thrilled to host you today. I will now hand the mic over to James um, to provide an overview of Map the System. Thank you, Latasha. For anyone who's new to Map the System, it is a global initiative created by the Skoll Centre for Social Entrepreneurship at the University of Oxford. This competition was created to encourage a learning first, problem-based approach to social change one where students take the time to understand and build upon existing efforts before attempting something new. Students and recent graduates are challenged with understanding a problem and its wider context. Rather than jumping straight into a business plan or a hackathon pitch competition or design sprint that creates a new solution or re rewards a quick fix, participants dig into the factors influencing and underlying the challenge, the landscape of current solutions, and the missing opportunities, what we call gaps and leverage points for positive change. We have students not just from business schools, but also from the arts, sciences, and a wide range of professional faculties. Students are here competing from diploma programs in community colleges and polytechnics, to liberal arts undergraduate schools, to graduate students at research intensive universities. And they all bring unique and valuable capacities, mindsets, knowledge, and experience. We hear a lot about 21st century skills, 
communication, creativity, collaboration, empathy, information and data literacy. Map the system is beautifully positioned to help develop and showcase all these skill sets. Across the globe, there are 50 participating post-secondary institutions and over 20, 220 participating student teams in Map the System 2021. Peter Drobeck is the director of the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship at Oxford. A global health and inf infectious diseases expert, you may recognize Peter as a frequent commentator on CNN and the BBC speaking to the COVID-19 pandemic. He sends his well wishes today to participating students in this video message. Greetings from Oxford. I'm Peter Drobak, Director of the School Center for Social Entrepreneurship. And on behalf of the School Center, Said Business School, and University of Oxford, welcome to the Canadian final of Map the System 2021. I want to congratulate everyone who participated this year, and especially the 16 teams who have reached the Canadian final for your extraordinary hard work under obviously very challenging circumstances. This has been a year for Math the System like no other. And the fact that you've all come this far is an extraordinary testament to your passion, to your hard work, and to your, to your commitment to the social and environmental issues that brought you to Math the System in the first place. Now, Map the System is all about equipping ourselves with the problem-solving tools and leadership skills to engage with wicked problems. And wicked problems are all around us. Everything from the pandemic to the scourge of systemic racism to the climate crisis, big global issues, but then also really sticky issues closer to home in each one of our communities. You probably hear all the time that you're the leaders of tomorrow. I say, we can't wait for tomorrow. You're the leaders of today. So thank you for stepping up and doing your part to build the kind of world that we all want to live in. I wanna take a moment to thank our partners at Mount Royal University, at McConnell and Recode, at Trico, uh, and of course, all of the educators across Canada uh, who have really made all of this possible and shown great vision and leadership. We couldn't do this without you. Uh, it's gonna be a really exciting event today. We're excited to tune in from across the pond, even though it'll be pretty late for us. Uh, I wanna wish the best of luck to all eight finals who are gonna be competing uh, in the Canadian finals today. And of course, we'll look forward to hosting the four finalists at the global final um, uh, here in Oxford virtually in June. And I do want to encourage all of you to mark your calendars uh, for the global final because we're doing something different this year. Of course, we can't have everyone to Oxford as we love to do and usually look forward to every year. But because we're forced to do this virtually, we're going to blow the doors open and try to make this as exciting and engaging as possible to you and to participants around the world. So in addition to the global final, Final, we're going to be running something that entire week called Systems Week. So the competition will be bookended each day uh, by some extraordinary sessions of academics, practitioners, and other change makers looking at systemic issues from healthcare to climate change to inequality, really thinking about what it takes to create deep systemic change. It's going to be an awesome learning experience. It's going to be a really fun convening, and I hope you can all take part. More on that soon. For now, let's celebrate uh, the eight finalist teams uh, and we'll be cheering for you to everyone gathered today to watch this. Um, it's not as easy to bring energy online, so you're just gonna have to cheer that much more visually and that much more loudly. Have a great day and good luck, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Map the System was brought to Canada in 2016 when the McConnell Foundation Recode Initiative partnered with the Trico Charitable Foundation and the School Center to support building this Canadian level of competition. This partnership grew because of the strong alignment of the values in systems education, social change, and leadership development. Canada is the only country in the world to host a nationwide final, and Canadian student teams have consistently risen to the challenge with a strong showing at the global level, including finishing first in three of the past four global competitions. The success of these teams on the global stage is a reflection of the remarkable education and support students receive from their campus educators and institutions throughout the country. It is with the continuous support of our partner organizations, including the financial and non-financial support of the McConnell and Trico Foundations, that the Institute for Community Prosperity is able to continue hosting Map the System Canada. 
Now over to Kelly Hodgins of the McConnell Foundation to say a few words. Hi everyone. Um, thank you again. Uh, thanks James. Um, I'll make my remarks very short. Um, as, as James said, uh, McConnell is a foundation working to improve social and environmental outcomes across Canada. And my work there along with a couple of my colleagues is focused on the post-secondary sector and how we can and drive social and environmental impacts through the different assets and capacities of universities and colleges, but particularly the people that move through them. So when we heard about Map the System out of the University of Oxford back in 2016, we wondered about the value in maybe nurturing something like that here in Canada, as James mentioned. So the first year we tried that, it was a great success and it's really only gotten better from there. And I just really need to highlight though that the reason it's gotten better is because we entered into this partnership with Mount Royal University who really stepped up to take over the running of the competition. Um, and as each of you probably has experienced the support from, from their team. I just, I owe such a debt of gratitude to Tash and James and Amy and Colson, um, the team there, each year, they're really adapting the program to become better, to become stronger, always in line with the changing needs across Canada, trying to just make this competition the best and the most relevant experience for students. Um, so, and then really, I mean, at the heart of it all, it's, it's you, it's the students who make it so wonderful year over year and the educators who support them. This competition is really animated by you by your feedback and your work and your passion. And really it's just, it's such an achievement to be at this stage today. Um, and it's really, really energizing for and exciting for me and my colleague Andrea, who's also on the call to see the commitment that you have to these topics. And so just really congratulations, we're, we're excited. Thank you, Kelly. And I apologize if you hear sirens in the background. <laughs> this year, uh, 16 post-secondary institutions from across Canada participated in MAPSA system. Each year we see more and more schools becoming involved as well as those already participating, deepening their involvement through course-based or co-curricular programming. At each institution, there are also a number of dedicated educators, faculty members, staff, and or former students, as well as their supporting departments who help bring this competition to life. This is multiple months of commitment and no small undertaking from advertising the program and recruiting students to recruiting and prepping judges hosting campus level finals, and of course, coaching and mentoring teams. Across these 16 Canadian institutions, there were 111 Canadian student teams who participated in this year's Map the System. While this number is down from previous years, it is still remarkable that 300 plus students had the passion and tenacity to complete their research, systems maps and presentations in what we know is one of the most stressful and anxious years in modern history to be a student and undoubtedly the most challenging to collaborate as a team. Each team has spent countless hours researching, writing, conducting interviews, and of course, visualizing systems. This year, teams were also faced with the additional challenge of navigating a global pandemic. So congratulations to you all. In April, participating institutions hosted their own campus final events, during which they chose their top team to represent their university or college at the national level. Throughout this past week, all the Canadian finalist teams have been engaged in a number of activities, including, uh, sorry, all 16 teams, uh, including coaching sessions on Monday and Tuesday, a student social event, and the semi-final semi event that took place on Wednesday. All 16 teams presented before a panel of judges in that semi-final, and after careful consideration, Reviewing their um, detailed submissions, the judges chose the top eight teams to advance to today's Canadian final. Today, we'll be, we will be reviewing um, we will be reviewing the presentations from these top Canadian teams, and the event will close with the announcement of this year's Map the System Canada winning teams. So, out of the eight, four teams will be selected today to go on to represent their institutions and Canada in the Map the System Global Final hosted by Oxford in June. Equally critical to supporting this competition are of course the judges. And I'd like to first acknowledge the many judges who supported the competition at those local campus levels. 
thank you for your time and expertise in supporting the students across the country in their journey to this national stage. And I'll now briefly introduce our national judges panel. This year, we have a remarkable cohort of judges from across Canada. Dr. Nino Antadze is an assistant professor of environmental studies at the University of Prince Edward Island. Jody Callahu Stonehouse is Cree and Mohawk from Michelle First Nation and is the executive director of the Yellowhead, Yellowhead Indigenous Education Foundation. Alexia McKinnon, a citizen of the Champaign and Asiac First Nation, is the director of Indigenous Business Programs at the BD School of Business, Simon Fraser University. Anna Johnson is the Network Engagement Manager at Ashoka Canada. JP Bergowitz is the Chief Strategy Officer for Community Foundations of Canada. Violin de Rosier is the head of the Canadian Red Cross in Syria. Monique Fry from the Chim and Seychelles First Nations is also Vice President of Community Success at Helpseeker. And Deirdre Evans is a business faculty member at Nova Scotia Community College. Our thanks and gratitude goes, goes out to these judges who've spent so many hours reading submissions, watching online presentations, and contributing their own reflections and thoughtful suggestions to the teams. I'll now hand it back to Tash to go over the evaluation process. Thank you, James. The presentations that you will be seeing today are only one component of the competition. In fact, the majority of the work that teams do go into the creation of a visual systems map, a 3000 word research analysis, and a detailed bibliography. Each of the written submission materials are evaluated on, on the following criteria, an application of a systems thinking approach, understanding of the challenge landscape, an understanding of existing solution, solution efforts, identification of gaps and leverages of change, and key insights and lessons learned. Each team has spent countless hours researching, conducting interviews, and mapping systems over the past four months. The system map, research analysis, and bibliography account for 70% of the team's final score. Like James had mentioned earlier, the judges have been busy this week evaluating the written submission materials of every team. If you are in, um, during today's event, the teams will be presenting live their 10 minute presentations. This is the last component that teams are, are to prepare as part of Map the System. The presentation is a part of the competition that most mimics a business pitch competition. In the 10 minute presentation, teams are required to demonstrate their understanding of a broader system in which their challenge exists. What are the root causes of the problem? And what might be the elements necessary for transformation? Participants are not asked to provide a solution, but rather to highlight an understanding of the current state of their challenge. In their presentation, teams should be able to articulate the new perspective that systems thinking brings to their complex challenge, highlight any assumptions, systemic patterns, connections, gaps, and potential leverages of change that the system analysis has surfaced. It's no easy task. And so you are in for a, a great list of presentations today. So some of you might be wondering, what are teams competing for? Teams that are presenting today are competing for the opportunity to represent Canada and their institutions in the global Map the System final hosted by Oxford University. Today, the judges will be selecting four winning teams. Along with becoming a global finalist, the top four teams today will be rewarded with a $2,000 cash prize per team. There will also be an opportunity for you, the audience, to select two audience choice winners today. The audience choice winners from room A and room B will be given a $250 Canada Helps gift card to donate to a Canadian charity of their choice. Details about the audience choice voting process will be provided later on. Now let's meet the finalist teams. For today's final, teams have been divided into two rooms. In room A, the following teams will be presenting Mount Royal University, the University of British Columbia, Wilford Laurier University, and Humber College. In room B, we will have Trent University, the University of Sherbrooke, Albert University of Alberta, and the University of Waterloo. If you haven't had a chance to choose which room you would like to view, please take a quick look at the teams that, we that will be presenting in each room. 
Good afternoon, everyone. This presentation is on fossil fuel workers facing a low carbon future in Alberta, Canada. I am Mitchell and I'm with my partner, Jenna. Uh, unfortunately, our other team members could not make this due to other commitments. Uh, we are environmental science students from Trent University with strong backgrounds in the physical sciences. However, we decided to take the challenge of addressing the socioeconomic impacts facing Albertans. Mitchell and I would also like to respectfully acknowledge that we are coming to you from so-called Burlington and Aurelia. Um, also known as the traditional land of the Mississauga of the Credit and the Mississauga Anishinaabe. Uh, this is the outline of our presentation. In section one, we'll address the challenges ahead. Uh, section two, the low carbon job opportunities. Section three, existing policy options. And section four, elements of a transition. Uh, this, we hope that these four sections will capture the current challenges, future opportunities and constraints proactive and reactive policy options and transitions that are just and fair that will focus on protecting fossil fuel workers on an individual level. Uh, in the fossil fuel industry, there is currently 140,000 jobs employed in Alberta alone, with most workers in Wood Buffalo, also known as Fort McMurray, at 31%. The current average annual salary for fossil fuel workers is $141,000 annually, with 88% of these workers being male and of Eurocentric backgrounds. The challenge is that all of these fossil fuel work communities listed here will face a gradual degrowth in population, job salaries, and job availability with a low carbon transition over the next 10 to 20 years. If we look at a typical employee out of the Alberta fossil fuel sector, potentially in their mid forties, making over $100,000 a year and a sole income provider to their household, they are currently being impacted by specific government climate policy that is going to cause a gradual but steady degrowth in employment and job salaries over generations to come in this sector. We have witnessed in the past examples of transitions like this one to come. For instance, the post-industrial uh, transition in the city of Peterborough, where we are from, uh, from manufacturing companies such as General Electric and General Motors closing and causing a shift in employee demographics and job availability. However, Peterborough has survived this transition like many other cities in Ontario, and we feel that Alberta as a whole will survive it as well and one day thrive as a low carbon economy. That is why the system we created strives for the transition to be equitable and inclusive of all employee demographics. This is a preamble into the future challenges that will rise in a low carbon transition in Alberta. Canada is transitioning to a clean energy economy. The technologies, services, and resources that increase renewable energy supply, enhance energy productivity, improve the infrastructure, and systems that transmit, store, and use energy while reducing carbon pollution. As environmental students, we feel that this supports our current research on the low carbon transition topic. There are potentially four areas as shown in the image of Alberta's economy that will be significant contributors to job growth in low carbon sectors by 2030. One is the renewable energy sector, two, the transit infrastructure and electric vehicles industry, three, the building energy efficient efficiency infrastructure, and four, cleanup jobs. The most competitive job market coming out of a transition will be solar and wind due to Alberta's southern, southern prairies, which receive direct irradiance and have excellent wind resources. The predicted available new jobs in the low carbon sector are 67,200 by 2030. These jobs will become available in the renewable energy sector, mainly in the wind and solar, as well as in the electric vehicle, and bus infrastructure development, energy efficient upgrades to buildings, the fossil fuel cleanup sector, and other emerging sectors such as geothermal, nuclear, bioenergy, or metal extraction. The challenge here is that out of 140,000 current fossil fuel jobs, only 67,000 new low carbon jobs are going to be readily available. Therefore, specific government action from top to bottom is needed with the utilization of proactive and reactive policy tools to ensure a transition is just. Proactive and reactive transition policy tools create a solution landscape. Reactive policies refer to changes that may be currently underway and aim to produce more immediate and short-term results. And one example of a reactive policy is pension bridging. So if someone like an older fossil fuel worker loses their job before they're able to receive their pension, pension bridging would be a form of income that fills the gap of salary until they can receive it. And this income, income could come, come from a buyout package or somewhere from external funding. The second form of policies are 
proactive transition policies, which are anticipatory and aim to solve a problem in the long term, usually after reactive transition policies are implemented. And one example, example of a proactive transition policy could be labor market modeling. And this is where models would project what skills and qualifications may be needed for future renewable jobs. And there are two main barriers and challenges to a clean energy labor force in Alberta. The first barrier is skill shortages, and this refers to the inability for employers to recruit employees with the required skills. And these are likely to occur due to an, a number of factors, including lack of training, lack of transferable skills, qualifications, licensing, and the mobility of workers. The second, or sorry, the second barrier is a risk of layoffs in early retirement, as many oil and gas workers in Alberta will retire or relocate to new areas or industries. And this would be unevenly distributed throughout uh, the communities that rely on, ec on economic activity from the oil and gas sector. Therefore, any decline in Alberta's oil fuel, se oil fuel sector could disproportionately affect these communities um, and ultimately lead to degrowth and a potential sense of loss. So moving on to a just transition, this refers to the ability for a low carbon transition to support communities, businesses, and workers in an equitable and inclusionary way. And a just transition emphasizes the importance of ensuring that the economy promotes human well-being, an adequate treatment of workers, and reduce so social and economic inequalities. And this first flowchart here shows the different elements that make a just transition, including dedicated funding, partnerships, equitability, reliable information, health and safety, and a strong public sector. A just transition must also consider stakeholders, and this second flowchart here shows the different stakeholders that could be involved in a low carbon transition, and they can include all levels of government and businesses, workers and community members. And in order to achieve a just transition, stakeholders need to engage in social dialogue between themselves to identify their acceptability of low carbon industries. So for our concluding piece, the impacts of transitioning toward a low carbon economy extend far beyond the workers that are directly employed in the industry. And a just transition is necessary to minimize the impacts on people and communities while also ensuring that there is a smooth climate transition. And as many other environmental students may consider the fossil fuel industry in Alberta as a destructive sector upon the environment and social issues, the reality is that the workers are intelligent and hardworking individuals with families to support that deserve to be treated with an inclusive and equitable transition in the future of renewable jobs. Thank you. Excellent, uh, and two minutes to spare, well done. Uh, one question from one of the judges. Hi, my name is Jody Calahoustonos. Uh, lovely for your presentation, well done. My question for you this morning is, um, I'm wondering where you see the narrative or identity around the oil industry uh, used as a leverage and or how to make systems change through the process of people's identity. You talked about well-being. Um, what happens when people's identity is uh, connected to this notion of being an oil worker? Uh, did you think about that in the system? Well, did you want to tackle that or shall I go for it? Um, if you have something, you can go first. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so it wasn't something that we necessarily really um, put our full heads into research it. Um, we mostly just acknowledge that any kind of change in um, community could impact uh, communities or individuals' social like well-being. Um, so I from what I understand about you asking about identity, um, I think that really any decline that we would see in the fossil fuel industry um, would significantly impact people in their ability to sustain themselves essentially and or the idea of that industry um, depleting and it making up such a large percentage of Alberta's economy, um, I think that can be really scary to a lot of people. And I would expect that it has a lot of backlash. And I think that's kind of uh, what we're seeing already. Um, so in short, to answer your question, um, people would experience that sense of loss uh, from these uh, jobs that they like really define themselves with um, and would be more hesitant to maybe adopt these uh, global and national uh -huh. climate policies. If I might chime in there real quick, um, the same thing has happened uh, 20 years ago. So uh, in the cod fishery collapse in Newfoundland, as an example, a lot of those people, hardworking people over there lost their identities due to that. And uh, they they relied on 
some of them, a lot of them rely on the fossil fuel industry now as their identities. So the same thing, uh, trans same transition is bound to happen with Alberta's and fossil fuel sector. Uh, but uh, definitely the identity of it's going to be affected. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Jenna and, and Mitchell. Um, so we'll, we'll while um, uh, Adam and Amandine are getting set up with uh, Sherbrooke, uh, I'll mention as well um, that the four judges that are joining us here are Monique, Deirdre, Anna, and Jody. So thanks for being in our stream. <laughs> um, so next up will be uh, Université du Sherbrooke and Adam and Amandine. Whenever you're you're ready, uh, you can begin. Yeah, I'm just taking a moment to share my uh, our PowerPoint. Sure, it takes a takes a few minutes. <laughs> Take your time. These uh, transitions are a good time for people to have a bio break too. By the way. <laughs> <clears throat> Can everyone see the slides? Yeah, it's not in the presentation mode, though. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, good. Perfect. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Okay, whenever you're ready. That's great. Okay, perfect. You ready, Adam? <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> perfect. Let's go. Okay. What does the coronavirus crisis and the climate crisis have in common? The two crises have revealed the inequalities that remain across our societies. While they both have the potential to impact anyone, they do not impact everyone equally. Whether it is an environmental or a health crisis, women are often systematically disadvantaged. Today, we would like to share with you our findings and the map of a system that we think can be improved to better respond and adapt to climate change. We aimed to take a closer look at the gender-based differentiated impacts of climate change. Now let's take a look at our team. My name is Amandine. I work at the Réseau des Femmes en Environnement in Montreal. I have the pleasure to work on this project with Adam. Thank you, Amandine, for the introduction. Um, same here. Yeah, so my name is Adam. I'm a PhD student in electrical and computer engineering. Uh, I am definitely here to learn more about social and environmental challenges. Um, so let's take a look at climate change in Canada. Canada is actually one of the world's largest polluters in the top 50 in the year 2019 um, per capita, and half of its greenhouse gas emissions come from the oil and gas industry uh, and from transportation. The consequences of climate change in Canada are seen in the forms of rising air and ocean temperatures, shrinking glaciers, uh, extreme weather events, and it can definitely have an impact on the economy when it comes to the degradation of infrastructure. But now let me ask you this question again. Do you think that the impact of climate change um, on different people, sorry, do you think that climate change impacts different people in an equal way? Well, you've guessed it, the answer is no. Climate change is not gender neutral. I first would like to say that we recognize that the gender we use here is limiting since it is binary and it doesn't take into consideration non-binary people. It is a limitation we face in research since it is the way um, gender is portrayed. Also, we want to emphasize the importance of taking an intersectional standpoint and recognizing that each person's complex identity affects how they are impacted by climate change. The combinations of income, race, disability, gender, and sexual identity affect people's experiences of climate change. We focus on gender here, but you don't want to you don't want to forget the impact of intersecting identities. So women across the world are the most impacted by climate change. The fact that their um, 
their rights are not recognized in several regions of the world, the world reduces their physical and economic mobility, their opportunities, and it accentuates their vulnerability. In developing countries, women are more directly dependent on natural resources to survive. Having to travel longer distances to collect water, for example, increases their workload. Also, following extreme weather events, there is often a noticeable increase in gender-based violences, such as domestic violence. Another example is the fact that the work related to caring for people is mostly carried out by women. It's often unpaid work, such, such as um, psychological support and the role of caregiver during summer heat waves, floods, etc. When it comes to psychological impacts, a study carried out in Saguenay following the floods in 1996 showed that the psychological consequences were greater for women. But when it comes to decision making, we see that even though women are more impacted by climate change, they remain underrepresented in the decision making in scientific spheres. For example, only a third of the 2000 experts who reviewed the IPCC special report on global warming were women, and of the 86 experts who wrote the report, only 38% were women. Now, men and women have different attitudes and perceptions when it, when it comes to climate change. According to a local-based Quebec study, um, it showed that 31% of men today rely on technology to solve climate change-related problems. Uh, and also the same study showed that among the techno-optimists, 61% are men. Now, the system. In our system, we identified many stakeholders at the international level is the United Nations. It definitely is one of those stakeholders that understand the link between gender equality and the adaptation um, to climate change. It, it facilitates intergovernmental negotiations and it definitely provides scientific assessments on climate change to world leaders and participating countries, which brings me to the second stakeholder, which is the federal government. It sets targets for greenhouse gas emission reductions by certain dates, it creates plans, and it definitely is one of the stakeholders with the biggest impact as it interacts with pretty much all the stakeholders in our map. Now also indigenous communities, they have more knowledge, they have a different vision, and they definitely have more connectedness to nature. So they represent an important source of information for the federal government. Also industry. Now, when you think of industry, you have to remember that the number one priority is economic growth, which definitely compromises their eco responsibility. Now, individuals, lifestyle changes such as recycling, composting, or buying local products can definitely have an impact on a large scale. Now we see that there is a broken link between the two last stakeholders because women's organizations and environmental groups tend to work in silos. In Quebec, the Réseau des Femmes en Environnement and Annie Rochette conducted a research with interviews among women's groups and environmental groups, and they have found that climate change is not a main area of concern for women's groups, and that gender and climate change is little known or little, invest little invested by um, environmental groups. Also, by emphasizing the individual's responsibility in tackling climate change with the most eco-friendly products marketed to women and the fact that they are disproportionately responsible for the domestic sphere, there is a risk of overburdening women with the duty of um, saving the planet. Then when we look at our stakeholders together, we see that, that the stakeholders with the most power or impact when it comes to tackling climate change are places where women are often underrepresented. For instance, in Quebec, women represent 24% of the public services industry, 22% of the transportation sector, and 26% of the manufacturing sector. Now solutions, we have identified many solutions, but then we're going to only uh, focus on those who are most relevant, like individual actions. So we've mentioned it earlier, recycling, buying eco-responsible products, but then putting the onus on individuals has the risk of, of increasing this mental load for women. Um, gender balance, another solution is gender balance in decision-making instances. So having more women uh, represented, but then as of now, men are still overrepresented in scientific and decision-making bodies. Um, now, government incentives and environmental policies are actually truly great efforts. And one of the examples is purchase incentive, for instance, for zero emission vehicles. But then again, Canada is not able to meet its GHG 
um, target. And at the provincial level, at the federal level, um, the reports and the action plans, like the, the plan for a green economy, which is a Quebec plan, uh, there is a lack of gender-based analyses. Now, green technologies. Um, everyone gets excited about an electric vehicle or a solar panel, including myself. But then again, thinking that technology is the only solution excludes so many other people from being part of the solution. Now, we have learned a lot. And one of the things that came up many times is definitely that we should reframe uh, climate change as a social justice issue and not just as an environmental issue. And it even came up during an interview um, with Ani Rochette, which is definitely an expert on the matter, a former um, professor at UBC and a former professor at University of Quebec at Montreal. Um, and then again, another lesson that we learned is that there, there is a lack of collaboration between our stakeholders we think that joining forces can definitely um, uh, increase the impact of their actions. Now, perception, we have seen it. There is a difference between uh, the attitudes and perceptions between men and women. And there, we think that this should be taken into consideration when it comes to the adaptation to climate change. Um, also, uh, many of the solutions that we have seen are system preserving, and none of them really do tackle the root causes of the problem. In order to bridge the gaps, the government could uh, provide core funding for women's rights organizations. In fact, Canada's disinvestment in women's equality in the, in the early 2000s has impaired the capacity of women's organizations to engage in the climate change debate. And as a result, climate change policy has mostly be, been uh, gender blind. Also, the government has to include gender-based analysis to its climate change policies and influence other governments to do the same. There's also a lack of research, um, gathering new gender disaggregated data in key sectors to further understand how climate change impacts women is crucial. Also, encouraging women's participation at the political level and ensuring people see climate change as a social issue. Climate change is the biggest challenge of our century. Women make up half of humankind, so it is a matter of equity to document the impacts of climate change on women. And it is time we look for a feminist approach. Thank you. Perfect timing. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. So the one minute left, I tried to uh, squeeze it in. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's amazing. You just, just like, that. I think there was maybe half a second to go. Perfect. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one question from a judge. I would like to take that one. Thanks everybody for that presentation, that was great. Um, I really was interested in the view of all the different stakeholders and you talked about the siloing that happens between different stakeholders in these big issues. In particular, um, we know that sometimes even social justice and nonprofits, environmental groups don't speak with indigenous communities enough. We know that indigenous communities have a lot of matriarchs, a lot of um, matrilineal decision makers. Did you come across anything in particular where you could see how those could be blended more in terms of women and indigenous groups? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sure. Thank you for your question. Um, well, we certainly, well, like when we looked at women and climate change, we were like we were aware of the fact that women is not an homogenic group. So indigenous women are even more impacted. We know that in the north of Canada, the impacts are um, usually worst. Um, the impacts from climate change, and so we know women, indigenous women, are more impacted. We also know that they have, I think Adam mentioned it, they have um, usually more knowledge regarding their environment, like traditional knowledge, and um, this knowledge is like it's it's so important to take it into into consideration because it's different from scientific knowledge it's a different kind of knowledge but it's still very important um not sure if i answer your question correctly adam do actually I do, I do have something to add um yeah. if i may so honestly excellent question because it also um touches many of the different aspects of our topic which is uh, the fact that some of the underlying root causes can definitely touch the structure the patriarchal structure of today's of our society right and then you talked about matriarchy which is um, which is definitely very interesting. And we've, we've had an interview um, with, um, with the co-founder, actually the founder of a university in nature, actually that's a, a new um, style of education where they, were, where they focused a little bit more on the connection between uh, human and nature. 
Um, and then essentially, yeah, they confirm the fact that, you know what, um, women definitely have a different connection uh, with nature um, and having them in positions of, of power or decision-making instances can definitely uh, be very interesting, so. Thank you so much, great. Great, thank you, Adam and Amandine. Um, thank you. We'll give a few minutes now for uh, University of Alberta to set up. Now's a good time to hit the washroom if you want a quick break for anyone. So from University of Alberta, we're joined by Christopher Chan, um, Kayvon Miller, Kia Valdez-Betker, and Kabir uh, Nakarni. Um, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Wonderful. Thank you. So before starting our presentation, we wanted to acknowledge that we are speaking to you today from Treaty 6 territory. As our project touches on communities, including Indigenous ones, we first wanted to acknowledge the heritage of the land that we live on. So as a professional in the field of sustainable energy, I was very disappointed when I learned that Congolese cobalt mines have severe human rights violations, the US is very worried about critical minerals for electric vehicles, Chinese factories are abusing ethnic Uyghurs in the Xinjiang region, and indigenous communities in the Northwest Territories are actively opposing new mines. What connects all of these news headlines? It's the renewable energy sector. As the world moved towards net zero emissions by 2050, the renewable energy sector is growing fast. The amount of installed renewables projects is expected to grow by more than 500% by 2050. However, even with massive developments in green energy, we believe that we cannot achieve a true climate reset because as the prior stories revealed, renewable energy can cause numerous social and environmental problems. In light of these problems, we believe that we need to think beyond just carbon emissions. In the renewable energy supply chains of the world, green is not enough. Good morning, judges, hosts, and audience members. My name is Kabir, and my colleagues are Christopher, Kia, and Kayvon. For this year's Map the Systems Challenge, we wanted to ask, why can't the global renewable energy supply chain implement regenerative practices? Regenerative sustainability is a new framework that considers not only environmental responsibility, but also holistic social well-being. Now, how did we answer this question? Our scope is global because the supply chains themselves are global. And so we limited this massive scope by not looking at the electricity grids. Instead, we focused on wind, solar, and batteries because these renewables are expected to grow the most in the next 30 years. Next, we did a literature review and conducted interviews with stakeholders and experts. We also drew on Kabir's work experience in the renewable sector. A key part for us was integrating equity considerations into our approach, and so we sought out appropriate sources from minority communities, such as the Indigenous Clean Energy Network and women. We proceeded to create our stakeholder map and identified the renewable supply chain as the primary um, chain. And then we realized that there were many other groups of impact stakeholders such as financiers, labor, regulators, and civil society and citizens. We analyzed the power dynamics between these stakeholders and three emerged, represented by these different col colored lines shown here. These are roles, blind spots, and vested interests. Based on these power dynamics, we came, up with four, we came up with four key insights as detailed here in the screen highlighted portion of our visual map to the right. First, Minority voices, such as those of Indigenous people, women, and youth, are consistently marginalized in the renewable energy sector. Second, supply chain networks are a source of competitive advantage. Third, accountability is paradoxically lost when stakeholders share responsibilities. And fourth, cycles of apathy and relapse perpetuate the non-regenerative status quo. So with an understanding of our stakeholders, how do we now link these power dynamics to the problems they face? we identified three types of structural gaps. First, cultural and mental divides, which are foundational worldviews that inhibit the growth of renewables. Second, knowledge and skill gaps, which are voids with inadequate data. And third, policy and resource shortfalls, which worsen capacity in the path to a regenerative supply chain. And detailed descriptions of various subproblems related to these three gaps are shown in the map here. 
we created our turbine model to show the relationship between these gaps and came up with two insights. First, these three gaps converge on externalities, which are global spillover effects. So think negative social determinants of health and human rights violations. Second, these gaps entrench and exacerbate one another. These complex feedback loops stop us from realizing a regenerative supply chain. After we looked at our stakeholder analysis and then designed our turbine model to look at some of the underlying challenges, we knew, knew we needed to come up with a solutions landscape. So we wanted to look at the current attempted solutions as well as the fundamental levers of change which can, which can make real systemic change in some of the areas we've identified. And we came up with four themes. The first of these is enhancing supply chain transparency. Why is this important? Because not only are human rights violations occurring with relation to renewable energy, but they are actually disproportionately cited in developing countries as well as areas of the world that are taking on the upstream parts of the supply chain, such as mining in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. There have been a few attempts at smelter auditing programs as well as global reporting standardization, but these solutions currently don't go far enough. There needs to be improved harmony between international figures, and there needs to be increased accountability and enforceability. Also, there needs to be the use of auditing and certification practices, such as auditing QR. We believe that intergovernmental organizations, as well as renewable energy companies, are key stakeholders who can spearhead this theme. Secondly, coordinating design and development. The reason that this is crucial is because what's the point of having clean energy if those technologies are not being taken proper carriage of at the end of their lives? So new recycling technologies for notoriously difficult to disassemble components like wind turbine blades or the panels on solar panels are being introduced. And there are some attempts at extended producer responsibility, especially in Europe, which essentially mandates that a manufacturer or a designer of a renewable technology product also must take carriage for its end of life considerations and waste management. However, if we were able to increase the open innovation ecosystems, we'd be able to increase research and development into some of these techniques, and we'd also be needing to have improved policies for international cooperation. So investors and intergovernmental organizations, again, are stakeholders who can make a lasting impact here as we move to a climate systems reset. Third, building human capital. This is one of the themes that was most prevalent in a lot of our interviews, especially one that we had with Meredith Adler, who's the executive director of Student Energy. And she really emphasized to us how important it is to get women, youth, and BIPOC communities involved in the, in the energy transition, because currently they're on the fringe and they need to be in the center and they need to be consulted more. So right here in Canada, we have an example of a program of government wage subsidies that is moving in that direction. And in France, there's an example of a uh, attempt to quantify skill demands for the renewable energy sector. But there can be even more done to have dedicated work on clean energy training programs, to have a mix of finance techniques such as blended and microfinancing for community-led projects, and to directly target those underrepresented groups. We learned that labor unions, investors, and educators themselves would be stakeholders who can make a change in this theme. Finally, achieving geographic harmonization is critical because many regions are being left out of the energy transition. Right now, there's been some attempts at mitigating or nullifying some of the externalities that are at the center of our turbine model, but we believe that even more needs to be done. And we wanted to draw attention to two in particular, one of those being upstream health solutions, which could, um, which could mitigate some of the negative social determinants of health, as well as the, the seeking of true community buy-in, which is typically free, prior, and informed consent. Different levels of government, multilateral banks, NGOs and indigenous communities can make changes here and must be consulted to make some of these lasting changes. So of the four themes that we identified, we believe that addressing geographic inequities would be one of the prime starting grounds because of the fact that intergovernmental organizations right now have a lot of leverage to make positive changes there. So what has our group learned from all this? From our turbine visual, we saw that the challenges in the sector are linked by deep-rooted undercurrents that treat the consequences of the supply chain as an unfortunate and relatively minor cost of doing business. From our stakeholder analysis, we realized that this entire supply chain, especially traditionally marginalized groups, are siloed by different beliefs and incentives that discourage cooperation. Through reviewing our current solutions landscape, while showing glimmers of hope that change can occur, 
they fall short to create effective global change. For limitations and future avenues for this research, first, regenerative, regenerative models should be explored for other emergent renewable energies like hydro and geothermal. Second, deeper partnerships with local communities is needed, especially indigenous and minority communities who are often left out of the mainstream academic approaches. Third, robust and sweeping recommendations are difficult to make because global supply chain interventions are greatly affected by hard to predict events, such as geopolitical events and evolving technological changes like new energy storage technologies. The renewable sector has an opportunity to grow the right way and avoid perpetuating the attitudes, behaviors, and practices that contributed to the climate crisis in the first place. This is why for a true climate reset, green is not enough. Thank you for your time. Excellent, right on time. Thanks so much, Juve. Uh, one question from a judge. I don't know if you guys can see me. Hi. Um, well done. Um, really important topic. Um, and I appreciate the way that you, that you lay that out. Um, you know, given the scope, it's, it's such a massive scope that you're looking at. Um, throughout your research, I guess I'm curious to know what perspectives you might have missed given the scope, given that scope, what perspectives um, you know, are missing and uh, I guess to add to that, what um, if you could have access to data, what would you what would you want access to and why? I could take that question, Anna. Thank you so much for asking. And that's a phenomenal question because it speaks to kind of the story that we started map the system with. Originally, we were looking at the Nexalacho mine, which Kabir mentioned in early on in one of the, the first slides. And that's a mine in, in the Northwest Territories. And the reason we were looking at that is because we wanted to see some of the health effects, as well as some of the land rights issues from a First Nations group that was sited near the mine. So it was actually very much kind of like a social issue. And then as we started diving more into the interplay between that, that group and the mine, as well as some of the products that were coming out of that mine, we started looking at our stakeholder map and we realized this is actually a much broader scope than just this one area, this one mine within one territory within one country. So that led us to lay out our primary supply chain of the renewables energy sector. And then from there, we were able to start mapping out some of the other stakeholders, which are the top and bottom rows, like the financiers, civil society, society and then getting the power dynamics between them. So after that point, we were left with all this information on the page and we were thinking, we okay, how do we connect these different pieces? What are the patterns here? Because the scope is very broad. And we realized two key things. Number one, there are three critical technologies that are predicted to be the most used for clean energy production in 2050. That's wind, solar, and batteries. And number two, some of the protocols, the policy, and the use of these technologies is actually very similar. So that gets into one of the limitations that, that Kia talked about is we knew we had this very broad scope that we strategically picked because it would be stronger than only focusing on one locale. So we, we focused on that scope and we made sure that we left room on the table for us to do more work later on the other types of technologies such as uh, hydro and geothermal. So we focused on those three because those are the most critical and because there's a lot of patterns that we saw that could be affected by some of the climate uh, and systems reset that we believe needed to be. As to the other part of your question about perspectives, I think this was also something that Kia made a good point uh, to bring up in our limitations and that is, is that Although we did some work in looking at um, communities that are impacted on the front lines of the, the energy transition, because the scope is global, we could be looking at that from a, a plethora of different countries and communities. Mm -hmm. So for example, Kabir has done a little bit of work um, in Ghana with solar panel installation. The, the framework there is very different from, for example, the next Chalaxo mine in the Northwest Territories. So we tried to incorporate both of those perspectives as well as other ones from every sector of the supply chain. That's also an area that could, could do a little bit with more work as you pointed out, and that we're very excited to, to continue working toward. Amazing. I hope you guys do. Well done. Thank you. All right. Well done, U of A. Um, so uh, we'll, we have one more uh, team to go, and it's University of Waterloo. So as you're setting up, 
um, Mohammed, Leah, and Zeno. Um, give you a few minutes. And whenever you're ready. Hello, Leah, Zeno, and I will focus on the problem of foreign labor issues in Malaysian palm oil plantations, where 80% of the workforce is made of migrant workers, many of them working age men from desperate circumstances in their home countries. The laborers and plantations were facing adverse working conditions even before the COVID crisis, and now the weak links in the system protecting workers are being exposed, despite considerable efforts over the past decade to improve conditions. News reports and human rights activists have highlighted many stories of misery and financial woe for workers, with stories of forced labor violating agreed to contracts. Hello, my name is Leah Fior. Hi, I'm Ewa Mazino Odibo. I'm Mohammed Asandra Rahim. With experience in teaching, banking, and auditing, we recognize our biases and strengths in analyzing this critical topic. We understand that there's no single explanation for the precarious situation that many labor find themselves in, but instead is a culmination of issues with the system under which their livelihoods depend. The understanding of the problem is colored by our experiences dealing with multiple obstacles to helping develop sustainability in our lives, especially with regard to developing better consumption and waste habits. There has been government intervention, the recruitment and transfer of labor with mixed results. There are agreements such as the RSPO to develop sustainable palm oil, which have come, come under significant criticism. Concerning the key sources of knowledge from the issue and our experiences, we can surmise that the best way to, uh, would be to involve all the key players. This being a global issue, we seek to identify leverage points that enable a uniform alleviation of key problems with the supply chain of supply, uh, a supply chain of palm oil without transferring responsibility. Given that the scale of the use of palm oil is truly mind boggling, we have taken a systems thinking approach. We have used academic and gray literature to conduct our research and have applied what we learned using systems thinking techniques, using a causal loop diagram and teachings by Donella Meadows. A conservative estimate of the amount of land use for palm oil production states that a large amount of the product is produced in uncertified or problematic locations. This is made worse by the need for palm oil ingredients in several products in daily and consistent use by consumers in the vast majority of countries around the world. The beneficiaries of the current system are the plantation owners, palm oil mills, and international corporations who get to reduce cost, increase profits. The plantations in Malaysia produce palm fruit to be processed in oil mills. The oil mills in turn convert the raw commodity into a form usable to make myriad consumer products. Our focus will be on the labor practices that are prevalent throughout the value chain in Malaysia with particular emphasis on foreign labor. The increase in the number of people working in Malaysian plantations is related to the growing demand for palm oil. The demand for increasing yields of palm oil is leading to the need for additional plantations and oil mills that process the harvest. This in turn leads to an increasing number of laborers working on various aspects of the planting, growing, harvesting, and then the processing of palm fruit. An average consumer does not get to see the welfare of the human factor behind the palm oil ingredients in the many products they buy, making it more challenging for them to consume responsibly. Given this limitation, our proposed levers for change will not be focused on the end consumer, but instead the corporations responsible for sourcing the raw material. One goal of our research is to identify leverage points for change to improve labor conditions in the Malaysian palm oil industry. We use a causal loop diagram consisting of labor related elements specific to Malaysia, 
Those are represented by light green nodes and global market forces elements represented by light purple nodes. Reading the map from left to right, the system boundary identified is key parts of the value chain leading to the conditions for plantation labor, which starts from deprived communities in countries like Nepal and Bangladesh that experience a low employment rate. This drives employment related migration to Malaysia, where they become part of the foreign workforce as both documented and undocumented workers. Some barriers to international employment can be relieved through labor market development such as migration policies leading to more transparency for workers seeking opportunities and enhanced freedom of association, a solution that could ultimately bring greater unionization to represent the workers' voices. As the global demand for products using palm oil continues to rise, worker well-being needs to be prioritized as a matter of human rights and plantation productivity. The way the problem is likely to evolve is threefold. An increase in the use of technology, greater government oversight, and increased involvement of international organizations. While greater use of technology in the harvesting and processing of palm oil increases operating efficiencies, it could lead to a decline in the number of workers needed. This could in turn have the unintended consequence of a greater and more expensive struggle for fewer positions on the plantations. The other development, greater involvement of government agencies, could reduce the severity of corruption in the recruitment and transfer of labor to the plantations, if and only if government involvement itself is properly monitored and carefully assessed without undue burden to laborers and employers. Lastly, an increased involvement of international organizations sanctioned by the primary buyers to facilitate the monitoring and reporting with consequences for non-compliance. This creates a reinforcing feedback loop and exposes a leverage point for intervention within the existing system. Interpreting the causal loop diagram from the previous slides, we identified three out of the 12 leverage points presented in Don Lamedo's book, Thinking and System, that are relevant to our research. Considering the time frame and the need for immediate relief, we identified both short and long-term leverage points, instead from the least effective to the most effective. One of these points of intervention is to increase the number of certified plantations while increasing the quality of the certification process and areas for your standards for foreign labor equipment and welfare. According to Donella Meadows, this is leverage point number 12, numbers. Although a least effective way to change the system structure, this aims for incremental change allowing RSPO to strengthen plantation workers' protection and decrease the impact of exploitation in the system. This will lead to the reduction of all sustainable production practices. A more effective point of intervention is to increase the flow of information in the system, which is level point number six. This can help to create global awareness on labor-specific standards, using this information to influence third-party decisions, both from the buying companies and the consumers of palm oil products. To further support these efforts, the creation of Palm Oil Plantation Workers Union can be used to change the system structure, which is leverage point number four. This area of intervention would address current plantation practices and lead to the development of collective solutions to protect the rights of plantation workers while catering to their well-being. From our research, we have learned that the value chain in Malaysia's Palm Oil Plantation system follows a shift in the body archetype. This means that the solutions to the systemic problem reduces the symptoms but does nothing to solve the underlying problem. To fully address the gaps in the Malaysian palm oil industry and its production system, more emphasis must be placed on the labor criteria to tackle the underlying light labor issues. Our SPO needs to be strengthened to develop a more dynamic framework to monitor palm oil plantations and reduce the precarious working conditions in Malaysia. Furthermore, accountability and transparency are key factors to consider as improving reporting standards is important for buyer and third party involvement, and it's also critical for consumer education. Lastly, documentation of local workers is crucial in changing the system structure. By reporting through organizational sustainability lens, socially responsible production patterns can be practiced in Malaysia, and the protection of labor rights can be achieved by promoting safe and secure working environments for all workers, including those migrant workers. All these can contribute to sustainable development goal eight in Malaysia, which is decent work and economic growth. In conclusion, 
Through our research of the Malaysian palm oil industry, we have learned how to apply system thinking tools to solve complex problems that impact multiple stakeholder groups. We have also learned that solutions can be applied through incremental and considered timely changes to provide greater outcomes within the existing system and enhance efforts put forward by key stakeholders in Malaysia and globally. We conducted our research holistically, recognizing that proposed solutions applied in Malaysia needs to be replicated in other regions, given that palm oil is being produced around the globe. We base the proposed solutions, which we addressed as the leverage points in the previous slide, keeping in mind that we aim for scalability at a global level, as, as a global system level, rather than addressing the issues solely at the country level. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Waterloo. Amazing uh, timing as well. Right on time. Great. One question from the judges. So I think it's my turn to answer or to ask a question. So I wanted to ask you about um, when you talked about creating the Palm Oil Planters Union and this idea of structural change for migrant workers, when we think about the relationships and networks across the system and the very nature of migrant workers, how do you think creating this union will work to create future stability because of the interconnected aspect of that system? I, I can take the question. So basically what we're looking towards is that multiple points in the system were basically pushing. So you were fixing uh, one problem, but pushing the problem to another. So the burden, uh, the shifting the burden archetype was very basically a very important part of it. It helped us analyze that we need to have small changes, but they have to be throughout the system, the unionization where these workers' voice was represented. And I think that was something that's common to a lot of the presentations today is that we're going towards sustainable development, but a lot of voices are being left out. And Canada is particularly vulnerable to a lot of these issues, right? So what we looked at is what is the easiest, well, not exactly easiest, but more like what is the most doable thing that we can do right now to bring these people in, have their voices be heard, and therefore also in a way that benefits the companies as well, gives them the responsibility that we have decided to do this, we're going to take responsibility for doing this. So it leads to stabilization, it leads to a voice in the system, and more importantly, it leads to a more sustainable mechanism for social welfare. And as we specified in the beginning, we were really looking at this one aspect because there are other issues with plantations. And I'm, I'm not, um, I wouldn't be surprised that a lot of you have a lot of questions about the entire system. So with regard to this particular aspect, this is what we decided was one of the critical components that could fit within the current system. Instead of having like, a rapid transformational change that maybe a lot of uh, critical and powerful parties would not be interested in. Anyone want? It, thank you uh, for the question and, and thank you for starting us off with that, Asan. Um, if I can just add to that, um, you, you point out something that's uh, within our, our most long-term leverage point. Um, and it's the most effective leverage point, but it's it's very complex because we're not just dealing, um, we're not in fact dealing much with national workers in Malaysia, but instead those migrant workers. And then of course the issue of the ones that come in documented, which would be eligible for union if unions existed in that sense. And then the undocumented, which just kind of fall below um, the radar. So I think what, um, Unfortunately, we didn't get to that level of having an, uh, a sufficient answer to that question um, because in itself, unionizing when you have three different categories of workers is even more complex, um, but hopefully it can, some of the issues can be relieved in the short term um, by more stringent requirements for um, certification by RSPO and then more oversight by the purchasing corporations that are buying the raw material um, to, to start to alleviate the pressure on what would probably be the most vulnerable within the system and that is the undocumented migrant workers. Thank you, good answer. Uh, very complex system. You did a great job. Thank you.
Alia, Zeno, and Muhammad, uh, really well done. Super interesting. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're only about a minute behind schedule. So uh, at this point, the judges are going to leave us. They're going to go into a separate call to deliberate. And then they'll join us again after the keynote presentation uh, in the other room. All right, so we're thrilled to welcome Daniela Pappy Thornton, the founder and creator of the Map the System competition as our keynote speaker. Daniela is an educator and author whose work focuses on social entrepreneurship and systems led leadership. Daniela has served as a lecturer at Yale School of Management, at the Watson, Watson Institute, Oxford Said Business School, where she was the deputy director of the School Center for Social Entrepreneurship. She designed an educational tool called the Impact Gaps Canvas, used uh, an accelerator programs and social impact educa education initiatives around the world. And you've probably seen examples in, uh, in this competition today, certainly we did in the other room where the G Gaps Canvas was used. Um, and of course she launched Map the System, which is a contest now running at uh, 50 plus global, global institutions. So Daniela has served as a consultant, advisor, and trainer at a range of enterprises from public companies to private foundations. Her work builds upon six years of emerging market entrepreneurial experience in Cambodia, running a hybrid social enterprise. She's also co-authored a book called Learning Service, and her TEDx talk on reclaiming social entrepreneurship and elevating impact uh, highlights some of her thinking. So having the privilege of collaborating with Daniela in creating the student guide to mapping a system alongside our former colleague Anna Johnson, I can speak firsthand to Daniela's humility, grounded approach to learning, and ability to challenge and push students to embrace their change-making potential, but without taking on a heroic persona. In every way, she is a model educator and the best exemplar of social change learning that I know of. So following her presentation, Guests will be able to ask a few questions using the Q&A function. So over to you, Daniela. Thanks, James. Those of you who don't know James, he is incredible. And my first thing I want to say to all of you is we have all had more than enough Zoom in our life. And the fact that you were able to make these amazing presentations and do them over Zoom and for the judges to be here from all different uh, you know, places. I just am so impressed with what you guys have put together. And I have to say, I haven't seen anything that seems to have worked so smoothly and um, gone so well. So high fives, everyone. Um, and I am going to share my screen and I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about why we started Math the System. Here we go. And but first, so I did my high fives already, but we'll get to more high fives for the, pres the presenters in a second. Um, so why did we start Math the System? Okay, so I believe that one of the most important skills that people can have is to be able to see and understand and think about how things work in a system. And I think that traditionally uh, there are, uh, oh, someone okay, traditionally there are, th there are some courses that really teach that well. And a lot of you might come from those disciplines. I came from the discipline of a business background where I thought that was not taught well. And I thought that this is the image of how I thought uh, business was teaching social impact when they started to take on social entrepreneurship or social change within a business world. And they were teaching, you know, start something, make it bigger, gain more market share, outcompete your competitors. And those of you who are, who are doing um, interdisciplinary work or those of you who are probably in other, uh, in other disciplines have realized actually social change doesn't happen that way. It looks something more like this, right? There's new initiatives, there's things that connect up, there's government involved, there's nonprofits, there's for-profits, there's a whole mix. And when we have a complex social and environmental challenge, complex one like all the ones you all have been exploring, it's never going to be solved by one organization. Right? So the initiative to start Map the System came out of 
this research that I had done called Tackling Heropreneurship um, and the, the Impact Gaps Canvas that James just mentioned. And the Impact Gaps Canvas is the frame, the initial frame for Map the System. It said, how can we create a contest where we can incentivize people to not compete to say, here's how I'm gonna solve this problem, but instead to incentivize people to really deeply learn about and understand a problem within a system, what's happening, what's holding it in place, what are the numbers, and also incentivize a learning of who's already trying to solve this so that people can identify gaps. And you guys have done that so beautifully today. And my hope when, when I helped to start this was that we could incentivize people to realize there's a whole bunch of tools that can be used to impact change in a system. It's not just a tool of a new startup or not just, you know, some people are really, you know, stuck on one tool, a hammer, new startup, new startup. Some people have experience of a tool, maybe a tool that's research, right? Research and publication, right? But there's activism, there's movement building, there's, I think you can be an entrepreneurial journalist, you can be an, um, you know, have impact through, um, through any not entrepreneurship, right, through an existing organizations, right, and there's different tools that are needed. And what you get to do is think about which tool do I want to use next, right? So the initially, um, I'm going to skip this, we'll get back to it. Initially, I thought, why should people join this? Okay, to better understand a problem, and to learn from others. And my hope is that you've done that. My hope is that you've interviewed or researched organizations, and clearly you have to have gotten to this point today. But my hope would be that you found some organizations that you're like, wow, I didn't even know that existed. Wow, I didn't know that that, that was happening. Maybe that's my next internship, right? Maybe that's where I want to apply for a job, right? And you've hopefully also through this process built some new relationships, both with your teammates, but also with the people that you've learned from. And that can help you um, in the future open doors with potential future partners. And by partners, I mean, could also be your future boss. It could be an organization that you start, uh, that you decide to work with, that you, you know, you apply for a role in, in government, right? So these relationships, uh, the number one thing I think you have as an asset right now, those of you who are participants, is that you are a student. You have an email address of a student and you can now, if you haven't already reached out to people, you can email them and say, look, I've just done this research on this issue that you are working on. And here's what we've you know, understood so far in our, in our research. And I'm really interested in getting involved in this sector when I graduate. I mean, I'm really interested in, in learning more and, and using this topic for my next project in a different class, right? And those relationships will really be able to serve you well if those are the doors that you'd like to open, if this is the work you want to do in the future. So I highly recommend that you do that. And then you've probably also identified different gaps in the system than you might have originally gone in thinking about. And some of you shared that in your presentation today. And so I just want to share a few examples of people who've used this type of thinking in their work and how this way of thinking that you have just learned through doing math the system is not, uh, it's not just an asset, the content of what you've learned, you've now deeply learned about an issue, but the process that you have gone through to learn about that issue is now a skill set that you have and you've honed so well that you are, you know, here today. And the people are in need of that skill set in sectors. You know, all in all across the different sectors. So you've had some past Canadian finalists who were looking at mental health issues in college and they identified a different gap. And you've probably heard about, heard about their work. And they said, actually, we want to now focus on middle school because we've looked at the system, we've identified a different gap, right? Here's an, a nonprofit, an organization, a social venture, that, had, that use this type of thinking to identify a different gap. A pawn is based in Bangladesh and they work in garment factories and they sell low cost insurance by as kind of like a reward system in their little shops that they have in garment factories. 
So they have shops that sell food and sell um, all sorts of daily necessary items. And the mostly women who work there, the, the women who work in the garment factories can come shop. And every time they spend money at these shops, they're able to earn credit towards low cost insurance. Okay? They went through a process similar to what you have all done with Map the System. They did it through the Ashoka Globalizer program that uses some of the same tools that you've, you've probably used to get here. And through that process, they looked at the system and they identified what they were hoping, um, you know, what they thought was unhealthy and, and how they hoped that the system might be able to be changed. And they came up with a different gap. Instead of just selling low cost insurance, they realized that there was a gap, that there was no market for low cost insurance. And what that means is they went back into their organization. Instead of saying, we just need to sell more. We're in one factory, we're in two factories, we're in 10 factories. We actually want to create competitors. We wanna get other companies to start selling low cost insurance, right? And so they had to get system thinkers like you all Right? They had to ha have employees who have the skills that you have now to think through this and start to change their organization so that they can influence change. This type of thinking is also useful in for-profit companies. Care.com is a public company and they, uh, you can hire nannies through them or you can hire senior care workers and they use the same tools in the impact gap canvas and this type of thinking in their organization to look at the system because they realized most of many of the people who are doing senior care work are uh, have migrated to to America if, if we're looking simply uh, in in the their U.S. offices, which, which was where I was helping them work, or they've realized that there's different laws, different immigration laws, and and things that are impacting people. You know um, how people are paid above. The, on the books or off the books. And there's these things in the system that were harming their potential future um, participants of care.com. And so they were realizing, gosh, if we just stay blind and we only focus on our organization, we're missing the opportunity to help change a system that's unhealthy, right? So the skill sets that you've learned through the classes that you've taken to get here, or just, you know, if through map the system, if this was the first time you've started to, to, to do a, a system mapping process, those skills are applicable in businesses, they're applicable in nonprofits, they're applicable in governments. And there are people out there who will, wanna, who will want to hire you because of those skill sets. So what you've done is a process probably similar to this. You've identified the system that you wanted to work on and that was subjective. You got to choose, what do we care about? What are we interested in? What do we wanna learn about, right? Then you researched and mapped the systems and you looked at gaps when we got to just see some of those presentations today, which are impressive and beautiful. And you've come up with you know, really interesting identification of gaps. And now you get to decide what to do with this, right? What do you wanna do? Well, it's objective-ish, I said. So it's objective-ish because nobody can ever know a whole system, right? We could go through this process for a few months on map the system, we could go through it through a few, for a few years doing our PhD, and we will always still have our own perspective and our own sphere of, of strength of what part of the system we understand. But the more energy we put in, the more we have identified different places in the system that we now have a little more understanding. Now you get to decide, what do I wanna do with this? Do I wanna share this learning in some way? Do I wanna share it back to all the, the people that I've interviewed or, or the re, you know, who, whose research I've used? Do I wanna reach out to them on Twitter, on email, however, whatever that looks like? Gather a group of people. And I know a lot of uh, different Canadian teams, finalists and, and finalists around the world have, have met with some of these uh, stakeholders with these issues and said, what do we wanna do together now that we've learned? And if this is something that you want to do in the future, either using these type of skills as a system thinker or working in the specific field that you research, you can now transfer this into your future career, right? So you've now, now get to look inside and say, what do I like? What am I interested in? 
which of these levers is most, most interesting to me, right? And you get to start thinking about how do, what do I wanna do in relation to, to this work in the future? And so to me, that is winning, right? Winning is not whoever's name gets called in a little bit. Winning is how did I take what I learn and transfer it into a high impact career, right? How have I been able, what am I gonna do with this now? And if this has opened any doors for you, or if this has changed your thinking, you've won, okay? That's, I, I in part, really feel yucky that the, when we created Math the System, that we made it as a competition. Because really what we're learning is that we can't compete to solve problems in the world, right? But we did that simply to create a, a counterbalance to some of the other competitive um, contests that are in universities that are focused on solving. And so we said, well, let's make a competition that's focused on learning. And my hope is that all of you feel like you have learned something and clearly you have in order to have done the presentations that you've done today. So I'm really impressed. And I wanna share, I wanted to go back to that slide. I said I'd skip, give you a little whiplash by going back. This is a report by Baljeet Sandhu called the, the Value of Lived Experience. And the other thing I wanted to touch on of another reason for why we started Map the System was to give people um, a way to consider and, and reconsider possibly the, the value of lived expertise. And you've probably come across this in your courses or in your work uh, researching uh, for your presentations today. But if you haven't, what, the, what this means is that there's a lived experience of a social or environmental challenge, right? So if I'm somebody who, let's say I was homeless in the past, my CV might not say that. My CV might say a whole bunch of other things, right? But if I'm looking to create change and influence change in, the, in, this, in a sector related to homelessness, actually my lived experience of homelessness is a huge asset to, to the work that I'm about to do, right? And so those of us who want to create change around an issue that we have lived, this an opportunity to embrace our own lived experience and highlight that and, and be you know, proud and connected uh, to others with lived expertise as we do that work. And for those of us who want to work on an issue that we didn't live, which is totally fine too, because there's a lot of, you know, things that you might be passionate about that haven't impacted you directly, then map the system is a piece of a way to start thinking about how to apprentice with a problem, which I would say is kind of the opposite of the lived experience. I haven't lived it. And if I don't know enough, a lot about it now, how could I start to learn more? And you can start to do that through research, through, you know, through what you've done so far. And now you can start to do that through going out and finding a, 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 a job or research assistant role, an internship or whatever that looks like in that sector to start to gain more of an understanding and apprentice with that problem further. I'm going to skip a little whoop, whiplash. And I want to tell you um, about Sophie and I just wanna give you an example of a student who through this type of thinking was able to find a different path than she'd originally thought for her career. She gave me permission to share this photo and this story and she had originally um, pitched an idea for a women's feminine hygiene product company for Sub-Saharan Africa. And I was assigned as her mentor in the, in the work that she was doing. And so we started to look at the issue and I asked her to do some of the, the things that you guys have done through Math the System. And then we got to do a little internal looking, right? Which I, which like I said, that's kind of the next step. It's like, okay, I've done this Math the System. I've, I've done my research. Now, who am I in relation to this issue? Who do, what do I really, what do I, what am I passionate about? What do I care about? And we started to explore what, what her strengths were and what she loved. And what she realized was, you know, she shared with me that she's like a really strong researcher. She actually loves research. It's really interesting to her. And what we found was even just in our little bit of conversations that, that, that we had done, we'd found that there was at least, there was more than 20 women's feminine hygiene products in sub-Saharan Africa, just from one 
a nonprofit funder that we had found. They had invested in 20 different models. So there's room for a 21st or a 22nd. But what she realized through this process was, you know what I'm really passionate about? I'm really passionate about this topic and I don't need to start a new venture. I can look at these 21 and do research and then write a report that says, here's the different models that they're using. Here's um, what seems to be working and what doesn't and where they're working and who's selling these products and what they're made out of and all these things. So that when I put that out into the world, whoever starts a new one of these later or whatever funder is looking to, to support this work can read my research and hopefully um, better support this, this system of, of change agents because of the research I've done. And watching her find that connection between an issue she cared about and what she was passionate about and good, and good at was like watching somebody just find the perfect plug that they fit into in the, in the wall. So that is my hope for you is, I love, there's, there's a quote that says, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and then go out and do that because what the world needs is people who've come alive. So don't go be a doctor because you're someone told you to be a doctor if you don't like blood, right? There, you have just proven through your work that there are so many possible levers of change on each of the issues that we care about. And so my hope for you is that you can find your place to plug in that feels electric to you and feels like, wow, I have found my my spot um so thank you and i i don't know if we have time for questions i'm happy to stay stay, stay for some questions i don't know if the judges need to come back but um over that, over to you know, i don't want to i know you you have another meeting to to get no to. no i'm okay for another 10 yeah. minutes i'm good okay okay great um uh we're just waiting for uh for word from the judges uh not sure yet if they've made their decision so if anyone has a question please just pop it into the chat and uh do it. And I just want to echo uh, that, well, so much of what you said resonates, but um, I had a recent experience where uh, I was chatting with a multi billion dollar uh, uh, global company, um, senior executives, and I mentioned Map the System, and they said, tell, tell us more. And so I kept on describing what it was all about, and they were like, we need that. We need that for our employees. People are not thinking that way often enough and not enough people. And, and so what you said really resonates. Like it's, it's really obvious how this applies to if you're working in the public sector or the nonprofit sector, um, but it may be a little less obvious if you're working in the commercial realm. But um, yeah, I can certainly say that it, it really resonates as an important uh, skill set, 21st century skill set, I think. Yeah. And you know, promote it, share it. And really, if you think in this way, people need you. And, and when I was working with care.com, like I said, big public company, they said, you know, it's easy for me to hire a website developer. It's easy for us to hire a program manager, but it's hard to find people who really have these skills. So you clearly have them. And congratulations to all of you. Um, I don't know if Tasha's is coming on to tell us we need to go, but if there are any pressing student questions or anyone wants to ask, I'm really happy to, to, to answer. Um, go for it. And you can, you can type it in or you can speak. I don't know how. I've got one question. Um, thank Daniela. you, Christopher. First of all, thank you for the presentation. Like, I, I really appreciate the fact that um, and like, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but like what, what you're saying is, is, is like, you don't need to reinvent the wheel and build another 20 wheels to fix a problem. You need to talk to the wheel maker um, or you need to consider what other wheels are out there. And so like, I really appreciate how, um, how much you communicate the value of systems thinking. I was just wondering, it, like as an undergrad, if we want to continue this work in the future, um, like, are there places or like, programs or um, like, next sure, steps sure. that you could recommend? Because this is really yeah. exciting work. Awesome. That is so great, Chris. Thank you for asking that. So I, I would start, if you're an undergrad, 
I would go talk to a professor who you know gets this and say, what other classes should I take that are like this? What will help me think about systems? You know, what else is available while I'm still a student? And then when you graduate, um, there are different programs, like there's the Academy for Systems Change, there's the School for Systems Change, there's um, an online, you could start this now, a free course um, through Plus Acumen that is a systems change course taught by Robert Sigliano um, that they offer a couple of times a year. So there are there are other learning opportunities if your if your institution doesn't um, it doesn't have things, but I'm sure there's a lot of tangential uh, things that you could be learning. And then if you have an issue that you care about, now you have a way to start thinking about who do I want to work with? Who do I want to do an internship with? Do they think about systems already? You know, who, you can start, you have questions to start asking, right? That, that are instead of saying, you know, tell me about your organization, you can say, tell me, how does your organization interact with other organizations in the sector? Or how does your organization value, add value to a, a wider system of change, you know? And if they can answer that, great. It means they can start to, to think like that. Um, if they can't answer that, maybe they need you so that they can start to think like that, right? Um, so I hope that helps. I'm happy to, to, to share more if you wanna ask anything uh, to me directly as well, Christopher. Well, that's, and I see that's... Alexander's question, which I'm happy to, to we, answer we'll as well. Actually, um, we, we, won't, run? Uh, we won't get to that question um uh because we 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 do have to announce the winners um okay. and have finished so daniela thank you again so much for just sharing just a little tiny piece of your wisdom with us um really really helpful and really encouraging about um how uh, exciting this experience is uh as as students think about their careers their further learning their next steps and just their um themselves as 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 civic agents and 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 change makers. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, now we can move on to the audience choice winners. Um, so just a, a reminder here: each of the winners of the audience choice, there's one from Stream A and Stream B, um, uh, receive a two hundred and fifty dollar gift certificate towards Canada Helps. Uh, to uh, to donate to a charity of your choosing. Um, so, can I get the drum roll, please? In room A, the winner is Humber College. Room B, University of Alberta. Congratulations to Humber and Rube. Okay, now for the moment you've been waiting for, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Kelly Hodgins uh, of the McConnell Foundation, who will announce the four winning teams. Thank you, James. Okay, um, I am very excited, very honored to announce the four winners as chosen by our judges. Thank you again to our judges. Um, and before I announce those, I just really wanna offer again, my biggest congratulations to all of the teams. Um, each of you had really outstanding, outstanding presentations and of course your written submissions, all of that work. But um, we have four winners, um, not ranked, just four winners um, who will be going on to the global finals. And without further ado, and in no particular order, I am going to announce the first, uh, the first one. Drum roll please, Amy. Amazing. And um, the first one is Wilfrid Laurier University. Congratulations, Alexa and Coleman. Amazing work. Okay. <laughs> and the next one, second, is moving on to the global final. Drum roll, please, Amy. The University of Alberta. Great job, Christopher Kevier. Kayvon and Kia. And third, 
<laughs> Drum roll, please. <laughs> it is the University of British Columbia. Oh, and I lost my screen. There we go. Um, so thank you. Uh, amazing. Good work to Anika, Kathy, and Emily. And finally, the last team moving on to the global finals. And again, congratulations to all teams. Drumroll, Amy, University of Waterloo. So thank you everybody um, for all of your hard work. Congratulations to everyone who, who made it to the final. Um, we really wish you all the best in the next stage of that. Uh, to the four that are going on, we wish you the best in the next stage of this competition and all of us will really be cheering for you from Canada. I'm going to hand it now back to James for the final words. Yeah, thanks Kelly. Just echoing Kelly that uh, congratulations to each of the four Canadian finalists who will go on to the Global Maps of System final hosted by the University of Oxford in June. And please tune in for that. Um, congratulations as well to the audience choice winners from each stream. And finally, I wanna take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank Latasha Kafrobe for her outstanding leadership in managing Map the System Canada, as well as Amy Rintoul for her support to this year's program and Colson Proudfoot for helping with logistics this week. You can imagine the advanced prep and logistical complexity of running this week's series of events from the coaching sessions earlier in the week to the four concurrent semifinal sessions to the final event and the adjudication. And planning for the 2020 edition begins mere weeks from now. Uh, so thank you all for joining us and being part of Map the System Canada 2021. Stay safe, have a wonderful weekend, and see you next year. <laughs>